So, Denise, how oh, cold did it get in your wood? Okay, part of the wood? Getting started. Oh, excuse me. Hello, I'm Susan Nash. Really happy to be here. Thank you for attending. And I'd like to introduce you to our, our um, program tonight, Pivoting 2021, Thriving with Change. And today we're in our fourth, uh, fourth week. It's ESG Today, Critical Minerals, Gas Supply Chain, CCUS, Geothermal, and Analytics. We're going to go to our next slide and I'd like to, to let us know let you know what our program looks like today. So today we'll have a, a, a very interesting program with Ursula Hamas, the Energy Minerals President. We also have Denise Cox, former president of APG, and also um, Julian Chenin, who will be talking from the Sustainability Community Committee really quickly. And then we'll go into our overviews of discussions. So we'll have Anna Scott from Project Canary talking about re responsibly sourced gas. Corby Anderson, Colorado School of Mines, Critical Minerals, Hamid Sarouj, PetroLearn, CCUS, Alan Cohen, PetroLearn Geothermal. Then we'll have our new technology showcase, Analytics to Eliminate Environmental Hazards, Patrick Ng. And from 8 to 8.30, we'll have an audience discussion, Q&A, and networking. So what I'd like to do right now is I'll stop sharing, and I'd like to uh, turn the, the floor to uh, to Rick Fritz, our president, and have him say a few words if you'd like to, please. Welcome, Rick. Let me get unmuted here. <laughs> Hello. Welcome, everyone. Uh, I just want to thank uh, all of you for joining this, and thank uh, this is a ESG is a real important uh, area uh, for our members, and uh, you know as we go forward here. There's going to be uh, a lot of the companies are turning to the sustainable development of oil and gas, of course, and then there's other uses. So we're um, excited about these type of events, and uh, we thank Susan and the speakers. Uh, have a have a good evening of uh, good talks. So hello, and I'd like to um, now turn over to to um, Ursula Hamas, who's president of EMD. Thank you, Rick. Thank you, Susan, for having me and uh, having a little bit of a, uh, advertisement for ACE 2021, where AMD is certainly very well positioned in some of the alternative energy uh, critical minerals. We have uh, sessions on gas hydrates, helium exploration, uranium thorium, rare earth uh, elements, geothermal, and lithium uh, exploration. I think there are very timely a lot of these sessions and they could be of a lot of interest to you. We also have a special panel session and we don't know yet whether these will be in person or just on Zoom, but uh, we're going to showcase EMD the committee work uh, ranging from um, actually some of the shales, oil and, uh, oil and gas shales, the uh, gas hydrates, the helium, the geothermal committees, and with uranium and so on, you can also look at all of our different uh, committee works in our, on our works website, EMD website, and all, on our EMD YouTube channel. Also, our own Jeremy Platt and uh, Dida Baike are going to uh, have a uh, panel on uh, what's next in energy, a very critical thinking panel that we'll be very excited, uh, uh, excited to have. So tonight I'm very happy to see all these amazing uh, researchers in alternative energies. And thank you for having me, Susie. Oh, thank you. So uh, next I'd like to welcome Denise Cox. Hi, Susan. Thank you for inviting uh, both me and Julian Chenin from the Sustainable Development Committee. For those of you who don't know, AAPG established the Sustainable Development Committee in 2017. Our mission is to communicate broadly the economic, environmental, and societal benefits of the petroleum industry, and most importantly, its collective efforts towards sustainable energy development. We have uh, monthly bi -month or bi-monthly virtual meetings and uh, some of our accomplishments to date 
are our sustainable development podcasts. You can find those through the AAPG website. We've uh, interviewed Christy McLynn with ConocoPhillips, Cindy Yielding with BP, and our current president, Rick Fritz, uh, talking about energy integration. Um, most importantly, we've been very busy uh, this last couple of months getting ready for ACE 2021. We're very proud that ACE now embraces sustainability as a separate theme. We work in conjunction with the Division of Environmental Geosciences. We want to thank them. And we've also partnered with Theme 1, the Clastics Group, to make sure we have a very, um, be able to feature geoscience, the importance of geoscience and energy development and sustainable energy development. Our sessions include water handling and methane emissions, sedimentology and CO2, which discusses carbon capture, and a full day session. Please block out time Wednesday, all day Wednesday of ACE uh, from morning till afternoon. We'll have carbon capture, sequestration, carbon capture use and storage uh, technical sessions. And now I'd like to turn it over to uh, Jillian Chennan to talk about our special session featuring our young professionals. Jillian? Thanks, Denise, and thank you also, Susan, for inviting us. It's great to see everyone virtually in person again, so thank you all. We have a very exciting special session that's planned for uh, ACE 2021, and the, the title that our, we came up with, we're partnering with the World Petroleum Council, and it'll be titled From Petroleum Industry to Energy Industry, Sharing Global Perspectives on a sustainable future. And so it'll be a panel format followed by a Q&A discussion. And the three key points that we're trying to hit here are highlight broad trends in sustainable development within the oil and gas space that are changing the industry. Secondly, explore how the energy transition relates uh, the classical view of oil companies to the innovative goals of energy companies. And then finally, the third point, we'll be sharing those experiences uh, from the YP perspective, right? As we navigate this, this transition and as, as, uh, as Rick Fritz would also say, the integration, right? How do we implement that successfully on a global scale from a global perspective for a sustainable future? So we really hope that you guys can uh, come join us for the session, share your perspectives, and really have a productive discussion on what the future of our industry looks like. So, so thank you again, and we really look forward to this session, Susan. Thank you. Really so, appreciate so it. Um, so so, yeah, one last word. Uh, I do want to acknowledge our uh, Sustainable Development Committee co-chairs, Bill Maloney and uh, Sarah Barnes. So thank you for that. And they, they, they're glad to see this event and look forward to future events like this. Oh, great, thank you. Excellent. Okay, so we're off to the races now. And I'd like to introduce our, our, our first speaker is Anna Scott, Project Canary. And she will be talking to us about the concept of responsibly sourced gas. So welcome. Thanks everyone, apologies. Uh, the uh, Zoom instructions did not in fact come with the traditional earth science education. So thanks so much, Susan, um, for having me. Uh, my name is Anna Scott. I'm the president and co-founder of Project Canary. For folks who may not be familiar, Project Canary is a mission-driven B Corporation. We aim to reduce emissions through independent assessment of carbon and environmental footprints. Our vision is a world of net zero emissions. Um, Project Canary does this by independently measuring and verifying um, ESG data. And for those who aren't familiar, ESG stands for Environment, Sustainability, um, and Governance. At Project Canary, we're big believers in data and that you can't manage what you can't measure. And so solving all of the problems involves measurements. Um, what do I mean by problems? I'm sure many people on this call have seen headlines like this one. This is um, a paper from Alvarez et al. and a couple of years back in science um, about how methane emissions from the oil and gas supply chain here in the United States uh, were significant. Of course, much of this attention focuses on emissions of methane, which has a global warming potential or a radiative forcing anywhere from 25 to 86 times uh, more uh, intense than carbon dioxide, which means that this is a potential risk factor for the industry. Um, of course, at Project Canary, we, we acknowledge that solving some of these problems are going to be very, very difficult. For example, um, if you're in the Permian Basin and you're not connected to the pipeline, it's really difficult to find something to do with that gas. But um, you know, as somebody who is newer to petroleum sciences, uh, beyond the geology classes I took when I wanted to get a field course to the beach, um, I was really hit by the fact that there's so many leak sources that are really easy to fix. For example, this was an open thief hatch. 
Um, this was a dump valve that got stuck. This was the first uh, emission source that I was able to pinpoint in the field when we started our company. Um, and when I'd asked the field staff, like, hey, how do you like deal with emissions? Um, how do you fix things? Uh, you know, they said simple three-step program. One, kick it with your boot. Two, hit it with your wrench, maybe a screwdriver. Three, uh, if something's salted up, happens a lot in some of the newer wells, um, pour a little bit of water in your water bottle cap and then just sprinkle it on. Um, so I think for us at Project Canary, this really hit on this idea that to reduce emissions, we first kind of need to find them. And I promise I'm getting to RSG here in a second, but this is really, um, and sorry, responsibly sourced gas, but this is kind of the path that we've been on in order to um, sort of figure out how we can, um, you know, offer the sustainability services. Um, at Project Canary, our sort of uh, approach to measurements, I guess, in general, um, here focusing a little bit on, on methane specifically, is to focus on measurement frequency and detection limit and come up with what we think is the best solution of, of both types. So um, have a, a reasonably high detection limit, um, certainly not as high as you might get at like a traditional scientific laboratory, um, but good enough to get the job done and also frequency of measurements. Um, this is compared to, of course, to traditional techniques where you have a technician that goes out and scans um, your site. And when we went through the, you know, the products on the market, liter scientific literature, and, and sort of talking with folks how they typically address these types of, of issues, um, we found that this fills in the detection sweet spot of about um, 0.1 grams per second, which to convert that into standard cubic feet or some other maybe more usable metric, I think you have to divide or multiply by like 0.04. Um, you can message me later. Um, we took this approach rather than uh, using sort of um, you know airplane or satellite based methods because we saw that the resolution was uh, difficult for operators. Um, this, for example, is a 2019 paper um, from a professor um, out in California affiliated with JPL who uh, really said what would happen if we use NASA's best available technology and we flew it on a plane or we put it up on a satellite and we like just forgot about cost um, and the resulting lower detection limit is pretty high and also um, not super actionable especially for basins like the Permian you know where you have just tons of operators in one pretty small space. Of course, we've also seen from doing this, uh, you know, type of monitoring um, that by being, you know, we place these monitors continuously uh, in the field and we're able to catch a lot of intermittent events. This is actual data from an actual customer um, showing you uh, methane concentration in parts per million. And you can see it, it varies quite significantly. Um, one thing we, I also love about this approach is that it allows us to catch small leaks before they actually blow up and, and become big. Um, in, in terms of how this addresses a lot of stuff that um, exists on the site, um, this is kind of how we stack up to field data. This is um, from Adam Brantz uh, out of uh, Stanford's um, literature review of, of um, emission uh, sources from onshore US facilities. Um, where they found a wide range of, of different leaks. And, and um, this demonstrates that when we place our sensors um, within 100 meters, we do pretty good. And when we place them sort of within 12 meters or yards, we, we do pretty awesome. Um, what is that sensor? This is what it looks like out in the field. Um, it combines an anemometer with a methane sensor and a solar panel. Uh, we've evaluated it in the laboratory settings. We've evaluated um, in the field. This is uh, some uh, work I did at Colorado State University's METEC facility where we showed that we could catch a leak uh, as small as about 0.1 grams per second and as far away as 75 meters in a matter of minutes, which allows us to quantify the, the mass flux as well as determine a probability of where that source actually came from. Um, and this, of course, information is all available to our customers on our interactive dashboard, um, where uh, we've got a list of sites, we've got time series of chemical data, wind speed, a map, um, windrows, and then um, you can actually, we've got alerts here in the upper right, and we can actually click on an actual event and zoom in and see what was going on at that time. And this allows us to catch issues fast, but this wasn't what I promised to talk about. Um, what we've, we've been talking a lot um, with buyers, the buy side, and we've learned that having low methane emissions gas actually isn't enough. It's, it's awesome. It's important. We love our customers who do it. Um, 
And so what we've learned is that it, we need to think a little bit broader. And by we, I mean, I mean Project Canary. And so this is where our Trustwell Responsibly Sourced Gas um, Certification Program comes in. Um, Trustwell is a third party certification to verify that the operator has utilized really the highest standards of practices in all phases of their operations. Responsibly sourced gas is, is really just this idea that an operator was you know, using best practices um, in order to produce that gas. Our specific certification process covers four key areas, air, water, land, and community. Um, our process was, our certification was developed through a collaboration of industry experts, NGOs, um, regulators, uh, groups like NORSOC, uh, API. There are, of course, many standards like this on the market. Obviously, Trustwell is our favorite, um, but this is an example of how components of Trustwell map to the UN's climate initiative. Trustwell itself, I think, is different um, than many types of approaches that I've seen in the market. So our approach is to understand the underlying risk and control measures. So what that means is by taking into account um, like where you're drilling, where you're operating, um, and then the measures that you have in place that are able to address that. And it also provides an actionable step. Um, it tells you what you need to do in order to hit continuous improvement. Um, and if this all sounds really vague to you, um, this is what it is. Uh, it's a report, a certification, and then some, some detailed reports and analytics. We're really excited about this because we think it can be a very cost-effective way to achieve climate goals when compared with conventional gas. And in the marketplace, what's I think really exciting, especially you know with with the costs um, situation these days, is that uh, by using the certification, we've actually had uh, producers who are able to um, get a price premium on their gas sold. Um, and so what that means is that uh, while our program costs them anywhere from half a cent to um, up to even five cents per MMBTU, these numbers vary widely across basins. Um, we've found that um, price premiums. Uh, uh, end up being um, any, you know, around the five to seven cents mark here. And I'm sorry, that's exactly what this minimal cost um, is uh, referring to. Um, there have been a number of transactions in the United States uh, since uh, 2018. We've been involved with nearly all of them. Um, there's many states that have allowed this. There's a lot of proposals uh, that, it, you know, RFPs that come out every day. Um, typically, we've seen agreements last for a couple of years at a pretty minimal cost, um, and we've seen approaches vary pretty regularly. We've seen it happen across most major basins, and in all, costs, in all cases, we've seen this happen with a pretty minimal, um, minimal cost. Just wanted to highlight an example here of our uh, deal with New Jersey natural gas, um, where EDF uh, praised our approach and, and said that having this independent verification of everything done was, was really important. Um, we have some more recent deals um, that I haven't had a chance to include in this presentation, but in the interest of time, I'll let you ask me about that in the discussion. So thanks. Thank you very much. That was wonderful. So I'm Really appreciate it. And I'm happy to welcome our, our next speaker, Corby Anderson of Colorado School of Mines, who will talk to us about some of the ESG issues with critical minerals. Welcome, Corby. Well, thank you very much. Um, as you know, you solicited me on short notice, and I did not know that you were requesting a formal presentation. Oh, no, it doesn't need comment. to be formal. Oh, just okay. it. All right. Well, I can certainly speak to you to ESG uh, issues on critical materials. Um, as you know, our country uh, with the new administration is moving towards um, renewable energy, uh, electric vehicles, and uh, other forms of alternative sources of energies. So in, in my world, my background is in uh, metallurgical and chemical engineering. I've been in the industry for almost 42 years. Uh, last 11, I've been a professor at Colorado School of Mines. So the question, I guess, that comes to me right away is uh, when we want to do these things, let's just talk about electric vehicles. Um, you know, we create right now zero lithium in this country. We create zero manganese in this country. We create zero cobalt in this country. We create zero nickel in this country. 
And for every electrical vehicle, we need four times the amount of copper. And yet getting a new copper mine permitted and built in this country is almost impossible. So, you know, this is the ESG quandary that I see for our uh, current, um, what would you call it, society and or uh, technical um, community, right? Um, and again, Colorado School of Mines has been active in these areas. Our slogan is Earth, Energy, Environment, and trying to address these, uh, these challenges. But for me, this is a very interesting, perplexing quandary that I'm not sure how we get out of. And I realize that I'm, I'm addressing a geological community. Uh, for the record, I have never taken a course in geology. Uh, I'm an undergraduate chemical engineer. I learned all my geology by experience on the job, which is not much. And in many cases for geologists, um, you know, you're Luke Skywalker and I'm Darth Vader because whatever you find, I destroy, right? And so um, my presentation is rather short and sweet. I'll try and on the panel address some of these issues, but I see a a future that at least is interesting and probably challenging, okay? Oh, great, thank you. So the, excellent. So we'll have a chance to explore some of these issues more in the panel at ACE, but also when we get to the Q&A. So I want to, to encourage everyone to put questions in the chat and we will keep track of them and, and ask them during our question and answer period from 8 to 8.30. So thank you. That was great. Thanks, Corby. I like your- Off the, off the cuff. What's that? <laughs> great. What's that? I like your backdrop. Is that- Oh, that, that, that backdrop? Mm -hmm. that, that is the neighborhood that I grew up in. So I grew up across the street from the Anselmo Mine in Butte. And last summer, due to COVID isolation, I snapped a nice picture in the Far background is the Continental Divide, but that was a lead zinc mine that operated uh, through about 1960, and those were my my neighbors growing up. So there you go. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Well, thank you. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to welcome our, our next speaker, Hamed Sorouj, who will talk to us about CCUS and ESG. Okay, thank you, Suzanne, uh, for inviting me and uh, I think uh, Corby's presentation was too short, so I didn't expect to <laughs> present it as quick. So uh, can I share my screen here, right? Yes, you're a co-host. Okay. Okay, so you should be able to see my full screen now. Perfect. Okay, do you see the, the full screen now? I do. Is that, okay, perfect. Okay, so uh, as you see, my, my topic is uh, carbon capture utilization and, and storage. Uh, so the, the CCUS is a is wide topic and it's really hard to talk about it in, in 10 minutes, but uh, uh, I will focus mainly on the uh, technology side of it and uh, uh, kind of focus on the on the technical challenges currently involved in basically subsurface uh, sequestration of the CO2. Uh, and a little bit about, I mean, uh, the technologies that are needed re really to uh, to commercialize and make this type of projects, you know, viable and economically uh, sensible. So <clears throat> a little bit about, uh, uh, a little bit of introduction to CCUS. Uh, the objective uh, of CCUS is to uh, capture CO2 either directly from the air or uh, from CO2 sources such as you know, fossil fuel uh, power stations, for example, uh, and preferably uh, convert it to other useful products uh, or feedstocks that uh, can be used in other industries such as you know, uh, food industry, plastic industry, uh, you know, as inerting agents uh, for fire uh, super, uh, suppression and uh, other applications that actually, uh, sorry, you can see in this uh, picture here. Uh, 
So uh, utilization is, is by itself uh, a quite uh, broad uh, topics. A lot of companies, a lot of universities are, are, are working in different spaces to basically uh, try trying to make the maximum utilization of the CO2 uh, rather than you know storing it and uh, kind of destroy the, the CO2. Uh, there are wide, uh, I mean, uh, however, when, when I mean uh, the, the most massive utilization uh, of the CO2 is currently in, in oil and gas industry for enhanced oil recovery. Uh, the additional captured CO2 has to be uh, stored somehow, uh, and uh, it's proved that you know uh, subsurface geological formations, if qualified, are <clears throat> quite you know uh, reliable places uh, that CO2 can be safely stored. So these uh, formations are typically either you know uh, deep saline formations, uh, depleted oil and gas reservoirs, or uh, on mineable coal seams. Uh, so according to the uh, National uh, Petroleum Council, uh, the, the report they published uh, in late 2019, uh, only uh, United States uh, has you know, capacity for storage of uh, 8,600 uh, gigatons of CO2. Uh, and just to uh, give you, you know, uh, a little bit of uh, uh, flavor uh, uh, to compare it with other technologies that uh, have been developed for uh, reduction of CO2 emissions. Uh, Amazon Pledge actually announced uh, some projects that, that uh, uh, got funded for, uh, for projects that basically helped the industry to go toward net zero carbon. So uh, according to Amazon, uh, 100,000 electric vehicles on the road uh, can save four gigatons of you know, CO2. And uh, we can quickly do a you know, calculation to see uh, how many basically electric, electric vehicles are needed to, to compare with the uh, carbon storage capacity in the US only. So currently 19 large scale uh, operating CCS projects uh, are, are working or operating worldwide uh, with total storage volume of about you know, 0 0.032 gigaton uh, per year. According to the Department of Energy, CO2 uh, storage is currently the only you know, uh, viable approach to, to isolate large volume of CO2 uh, from the atmosphere. So uh, what are the technical challenges uh, currently uh, does not allow, allow, allow us to basically commercialize the uh, subsurface geological storage of uh, uh, carbon? Uh, one of the challenges we are facing right now is the risk of CO2 leakage. So basically we inject the CO2 into the, the geological formation that have been actually characterized, have been studies and uh, seem to be appropriate, but you know, uh, is, is really hard and impo almost impossible to actually uh, capture all the anisotropies, heterogeneities in the subsurface formation. So there's always risk of you know, CO2 leakage. Uh, um, currently, industry is working on uh, monitoring, verification, and accounting technologies, we call it MVA, uh, which help us to, first of all, monitor subsurface. Secondly, identify the, the risks, uh, detect you know, anomalies in the, in the subsurface data, and, 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 and somehow uh, predict uh, if there's any risk, uh, you know, uh, anticipated actually in the in the reservoir. So uh, another risk is the induced seismicity, exactly like you know hydraulic fracturing in a basically a smaller uh, uh, scale. Uh, so injection of any type of fluid, including CO2 into into the subsurface uh, formations, can can generate basically risk of induced seismicity. So. Uh, the smart detection and predicting tools are really needed to, to be able to uh, mitigate, uh, forecast, and kind of uh, prevent these this problems. Uh, also, uh, having a pro proactive mitigation system that can be used to, to basically uh, uh, inform real-time decisions during operations is, is really a challenge uh, because in this type of risk, we don't really have time to do a lot of uh, processing on the data to do a lot of you know, uh, interpretation on the data uh, 
to get to the you know insight and and make decisions. So it has to be uh, happen really fast. Uh, the next uh, technology capability that we need to basically empower uh, MBA systems is, is uh, uh, forecasting an ability to manage risk uh, with higher fidelity, right? We really need to be able to predict some of the risk ahead of time so we have enough time to mitigate them and, and uh, think about, uh, you know, risk mitigation uh, uh, remedies. And one of the topics that are really uh, of interest these days, and uh, the, the aim is to increase the capacity of the uh, subsurface formations, uh, is lo looking at different technologies that basically can either uh, reduce the volume of CO2, injected CO2, uh, or kind of, you know, uh, increase the porosity and uh, the void system in the in the subsurface formation to to be able to store more uh, CO2. So uh, what I want to really focus on uh, in this presentation, uh, and, and to basically address and satisfy uh, the majority of these challenges, uh, we we need to have a smart subsurface visualization system. So we call it SSVS uh, at Petrol, and, and uh, we are actively working to develop you know, uh, a, a, such a system. Uh, it basically mimics human visual system. Uh, as you know, the visual system uh, comprises the, the sensory organs, like uh, which are eyes, and uh, the part of the central nervous system which gives uh, organisms the, the, the ability to process visual details as sight. Right, so uh, there's also a machine learning function uh, that determines what actions to take in response to what we see. For example, if you're approaching a, uh, a, hole, a, a hole, right, or, 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 or if a car is basically approaching us, if we see something that we need to actually react to it, uh, this machine learning function can, can basically help us to, uh, to have the right reaction. So in the subsurface uh, world, uh, we have different sensors such as uh, seismic, micro seismic, fiber optic, uh, tilt meters, uh, electromagnetics, thermal uh, sensors, uh, et cetera. These sensor, uh, sensors you know, collect data and uh, we have processing system to uh, generate images of subsurface like what you see uh, here. Uh, the role of uh, Artificial intelligence here is, is to uh, first speed up the processing, right? We want to go from raw data uh, to basically images and insight in real time. That's the perfect perfect case that we actually uh, would like to see. It increase the resolution of these type of images. Uh, with these two benefits we get from artificial intelligence, uh, we can achieve two important goals, right? Number one, uh, making smart decisions. And number two, making these smart decisions in real time. Uh, and in addition to that, there are two things that we really need to uh, work on it to improve our capabilities in. Uh, number one is, is, is that, uh, we can apply advanced, you know, uh, physics-based machine learning uh, methodologies to to be able to see see the future, to forecast any anything that might happen, to look at the, the data that we're receiving today, to predict what's going to happen tomorrow or in you know uh, uh, a week or a month from now. Uh, that capability ex actually uh, help us to make this smart decision that I just mentioned. So. Uh, a perfect example of such a smart system, at least for me, and I, I usually use this, this example, is actually my dog. Uh, what they do is really amazing because dogs are really the famous for, for having this you know, strong machine learning uh, skill in them. So uh, when I approach my dog to basically give, give him a treat, although I don't show the treat to him, uh, he gets the feeling from, from my, my impression, right? And, and he comes to me, he sits uh, very politely and uh, wait to get the treat. When I approach him with the same movement, right? To give him his medication, 
I immediately see the, see the concern in his, his face. He doesn't see a seat to basically show his, you know, he's unhappy. Uh, but when I approach him to, to basically take him uh, for a shower, he escapes, right, to run away. Because from, I mean, although all the movements that uh, are the same, and I, I was doing this experiment actually uh, for a long time, they are, the machine learning system is smart enough to not only actually look at your movement, your, they, look, they, they basically put your impressions as, 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 as input to their machine uh, learning system. And, and they can, this is why they can make you know, really smart decisions. So this is an ideal basically system that uh, we should have for subsurface monitoring, subsurface uh, visualization, and uh, making the real-time decision making uh, you know, a reality. So uh, to have such a you know, real-time visualization and decision-making uh, system, if, if we look at it as a puzzle, there, there are several pieces that we need to have. Uh, each piece you know, uh, requires a lot of uh, research and development and uh, technology development uh, to, to basically make this uh, full puzzle possible. So uh, one of the important uh, pieces is the is sensor technology, right? Uh, a lot of you know, uh, technology develop, uh, developers, technology companies are working in this space to basically improve our capabilities in uh, uh, sensor technology. Another piece is uh, real-time data acquisition and uh, what we call it compression. Uh, it's one of the projects actually Petrol is currently working on uh, to make everything real-time with the current state of you know, technology that we have uh, and with the type of sensors and the volume of the data they are generating is, is almost impossible to get access to all those you know, uh, large data, data sets uh, in real time. So we have to develop you know, methodologies or technologies to, to basically recover this data in real time, process them in real time and basically uh, take them to, to insight. I mean, so yeah. real time da data transmission, is a challenge, uh, you know, uh, real-time processing systems have to be developed, machine learning are, are needed to basically uh, make this happen. Uh, reduced order modeling is, is uh, basically uh, methodologies to, to reduce the time required for numerical modeling and the physical modeling that typically takes a lot of time. Uh, real-time feedback uh, we need to get from, uh, from the subsurface data. Uh, Uncertainty estimation is quite important. Uh, we don't really have a smart system to, to put you know, uh, uncertainty around the data that we get from subsurface. Uh, agent uh, agent you know, cloud computing are, are quite important here. Uh, these technologies are growing uh, very fast. Uh, alert system. Uh, so uh, currently what we are trying to do is to, to get alerts from uh, raw data rather than you know, spending a lot of time on, on processing the data and invert them to physical properties. Uh, we should be able to actually in real time uh, get alerts from, from the data that we can quickly recover from the subsurface. And then of course, visualization tool to, to gather all this data, bring them to the basically uh, create an image of the subsurface and having such a you know, puzzle, uh, we will be able to uh, do real-time visualization, real-time forecasting, and real-time decision-making, which is the, the basically uh, vision of, 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 of the, uh, of, for future of the CC, basically carbon storage uh, is focused on the uh, CS of it. Thank you. So with that said, yeah, I'm done. Uh, thank okay. you very much. Uh, Good <laughs> Great, thank you. Well, I appreciate it. And I know these are rapid, rapid reviews, but I'd like to encourage everyone to go to our collaboration platform, Srethis, if Rekha Patel is in the audience. And I'll, I'll put the link in there too, but we have a collaboration platform where we can continue these, um, these discussions. We'll have challenges posted that you can get involved in and, and actually even get some credit. So anyway, so I'd like to welcome our, our final speaker before we go to the technology showcase. And, and that is um, Alan Cohen. And he will be talking to us about the geothermal and ESG. Uh, thank you, Susan. Thanks for inviting me. I'm going to press the share button and tell me if you can see my slides. Um, desktop.
Can you see my screen? Yay, yes. Thank you. Okay, I'll go full screen here. Well, let me try that again. Um, <sighs> for some reason, this is stuck. That's okay. We can see it. Yeah, but I, I need to be able to advance this, and I'm I'm not able to do that yet. Oh, here we go. Okay, let me go back. Alan, are you using a, an online version of the presentation? Okay, I can advance and, and don't worry about going full screen. Hey, I wanna build on what Julian was talking about when he was saying that at the uh, AC 2021, the focus is gonna be in transitioning from uh, oil and gas to energy. And I wanna talk about a particular problem. It's the problem of uh, companies facing late stage wells that have to go through a costly abandonment process, or um, they are dry holes that need to be plugged and abandoned, or companies go out of business and they leave behind for the taxpayers and, and governments to clean up the problem of orphan wells. And, and we can actually do something useful with these wells if we pick the right ones and that's to convert them to renewable energy. Specifically today, I'll talk about geothermal energy. Okay, so the state of Texas is facing a cleanup problem of $117 billion. Um, oil companies who, who need to, uh, to plug wells when they get to the abandonment stage because they're not producing many hydrocarbons and, and mainly just water, uh, that costs about 100,000 to 200,000 and maybe even more. And then, as I mentioned, there are companies that go out of business and just leave their wells behind. And then the states and the taxpayers are stuck with cleaning them up. So what we're going to do is to try to convert some of those wells, not all can, but many can be converted to geothermal electricity. Um, so at the beginning, uh, we heard Anna talk about emissions. It, uh, on the right, we compare the carbon emissions of various energy sources that are used to generate electric power. Uh, we have low and high cases for the fossil energy sources, and, and they are relatively high compared to standard geothermal. The technology that we're proposing is, is, a, is a closed loop system. Um, which has no greenhouse gas emissions unless there's an accident or a leak or something like that. So we're reducing the environmental impact. Uh, we are deferring abandonment for maybe 20, 30 years because we're gonna repurpose these wells to be renewable energy sources. And uh, we provide an avenue for people to take skill sets that they learn in oil and gas with some additional training and move into the geothermal arena. What we're looking at here is a system that doesn't require drilling any new wells. Um, we have a well in a reservoir that's in temperature ranges of about 80 to 150 degrees C. And we have enough sufficient good, good properties that we can uh, use the water to carry the heat up into a heat exchanger. Uh, which will then be used to generate electricity and the cold water will be returned through an injection well into the earth. <coughs> Pardon me. So uh, the way that we approach this much as we approach oil and gas exploration is we look at basins and then we funnel down into plays and then prospects and then to wells and projects. So this is a study that we did earlier that was funded by Southern Company, the second largest utility in the United States. And, and their main operating area is the southeast. So we, we did a study, um, these are Jurassic targets, and, and we've done others, um, looking at geothermal play fairways. So uh, we're not looking yet at well integrity or infrastructure or financials or anything like that. We're, we're just asking, do we have sufficiently hot rock that could be used as heat sources? 
and, and the areas in green and sort of butterscotch fit that. Uh, we then drill down and look at the wells. So this is a map of wells at 80 degrees C and above. Uh, we're focusing on uh, Mississippi and Alabama here. <coughs> we're in discussions to do projects in these states. We've already submitted a conversion proposal uh, that may eventually include up to 150 wells in Louisiana. So we have developed a well screening tool, which is patented uh, because you can't just pick any old late stage well or orphan well and, and hope to be able to convert it. And we look not only at uh, technical requirements, uh, but we also look at environmental and we look at financial. So step one, we define the required inputs and outputs for the system. Number two, we assembled and integrated play data. We looked at reservoir characteristics. You can read the slide. Uh, engineering, uh, including uh, borehole integrity, uh, surface facilities. Some of these are modular power plants with maybe 100 uh, kilowatt net power output with one or two wells feeding them. Uh, we've also looked at power plants as big as 50 megawatts with 20 wells feeding them. Um, then we look at environmental and regulatory concerns. And then we look at economics, infrastructure, and so on. So we use that to design a screening tool. It's got about eight main modules and about 50 or 60 different inputs. It's all probabilistic and everything's talking to each other. And then all the technical variables and their uncertainties are translated into financials. And, and we are applying the screening tool on, on sample plays. So when clients decide whether they want us to do a screening and conversion project, uh, we discuss cost benefits and then run the financials for them. So the benefit of doing this is we're extending the useful lifetime of the well. We are reducing the risk and increasing the conversion success through our screening tool. Well abandonment can cost 100 to 200,000 per well or even more. And by converting to geothermal electricity, um, we save that abandonment cost or defer it to out many years where dollars today equal pennies uh, when we present value things back to, to today. Um, and, and it generates clean revenue and income. So, so what's interesting is we're working a project for a client. The client is in uh, somewhere in Louisiana. The utility is charging them nine cents per kilowatt hour for their electricity. Uh, we're starting with a few wells, and, and we have calculated when, when you consider the subsurface, the well, the uh, surface facility. Remember, we don't have to drill a new well. We're just repurposing. So we're saving a lot of money here. And we look at the power system, and, and we can deliver for them electricity at about three cents per kilowatt hour, which is fantastic. Typical power purchasing agreements are around seven cents. What that means is this company is planning to use some of the electricity to replace what the utility is providing them at three times at 0 0.09, so 0 0.03. And then there's a timber company nearby, and then there's also the grid, so they can sell some of this electricity that surplus to other sources. Um, the internal rate of return is, is a useful metric for projects that have 20 or 30 year lifetimes rather than return on investment. So we use that. Um, in, in our case, this well will be producing hydrocarbons and then there's a fair amount of water production and, and the company wanted to do something reasonable with it. So we're going to convert it to electricity. The internal rates of return are 10%. Um, in, in other well cases that we'll select, um, there is, uh, we're, we're at the end of the lifetime and there will, won't be any hydrocarbon generation. And when the well is truly, um, um, the decision is either to abandon with no additional hydrocarbon production or convert, you can uh, subtract off the well abandonment costs and the internal rates of return will exceed 15%. All of that is without assuming any tax credits. Now, uh, I'd be remiss in telling you that there are other ways of doing geothermal, like closed geothermal systems, but those require drilling and they don't really address well abandonment. So, so I've talked about transitioning, I've talked about some of the problems, I've talked about some of the solutions, and I've mentioned that oil industry staff uh, can take some of the things that they already know and, um, and pivot into geothermal, uh, but, but there's always stuff 
about geothermal that's specific to geothermal that you really need to learn. So Susan has granted us the ability to do this. Um, we are hosting a training class. It is being presented by an independent contractor, Kevin Kitts, who has been in the industry for, for 30 years. He worked at Unical and he's worked on his own. He will be discussing various types of geothermal systems um, going from the geoscience through to the engineering. And if you're interested in attending, it's www.petrolearn.com slash training. We still have slots available and we have reduced rates for students and reduced rates for people who are out of work. So that's what I wanted to show and thank you very much. Well, thank you, that's great. And I just want to put a, a, a plug in for also the geothermal course that we currently have. And, and I think that um, we're going to have a special geothermal uh, session at our annual convention and also at your tech. So more, more is ahead, all good, good things. So we're going to have our, um, our technology showcase right now with Patrick Ng, and then we'll have our discussion. So Patrick, are you ready? And I want yeah. to- uh, Susan, could you let me share the screen? Um, yes, I think Alan, you need to stop sharing, please. Where's the stop sharing button? Um, it's at the top and it looks, it, it's red. Thank you. There you go. Thank you. Nice job, everyone. Um, well, as a host, it says host disabled participant screen sharing. So Susan, can you help? Uh, Enable it. I thought I made you co-host. Sorry about that. Um, so Patrick is here to show us um, his new technology, and making you co-host. Here you go. Sorry about that. I thought I work that myself and my co-author is Tyler. Chessman over at Microsoft, and uh, I'll give a link later to publish your paper back in 2016 on this. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. And one more thing, if we can successfully convert the shale wells into green shale wells, you don't have to worry about energy storage oversupply, because if you want to, you can actually go and do something a little bit more like invest in cryptocurrency mining. So all those energy can be used for something more than oil and gas as well. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Great. Well, uh, thank you, Patrick, and we'll um, continue to, to we'll, uh, if you don't mind um, stopping the screen share, we'll go into discussion now. And I noticed that Ashley Dowds is here, so I wanted to welcome her and have her speak briefly about um, rare earths and, and critical minerals. She's been doing a little bit of work in that. and. Um, what you see is potential. Hi, Susan. Thanks. Um, sorry for joining late. <laughs> Somehow I missed this. Um, but yeah, I think there's a lot of opportunity right now. Um, you know, there's been a lot of work by the USGS in um, metalliferous black shales, um, including uh, the Marcellus. There's even been some work by the EPA on um, determining how to extract um, trace metals from these shales. And um, rare earths can also be um, concentrated in some of these. It's just dependent on the right geologic condition. Um, but you know, there's a lot of good data sets out there from the USGS um, that with some combing through and some mapping, I think that there's a lot of opportunity there to, um, you know, transfer a lot of our oil and gas um, sequence stratigraphy basin modeling, um, thermal history, to finding new sources of these critical minerals. That's interesting. Well, I noticed that there were some good discussions in the, in the discussion board, and I just would really like to hear people talk about the issues in the, in the, the um, mine in California in San Bernardino, that's rare earths, and apparently it's owned um, 
Well, I'd like to have some of the people who have, have entered, entered information in the chat to, to speak a little bit about it. You talking about my mountain pass? Yes. Okay, Ooh, I'm in the dark. I don't know. Um, so mountain pass was uh, originally owned and operated by Molly core and probably seven or eight years ago uh, due to some external and otherwise circumstances, they went into bankruptcy. So another group bought them and a few years ago decided to go back into partial operation to make concentrates. Um, one of their primary investors were the Chinese. Uh, most recently, uh, they have listed on the New York Stock Exchange, they have diluted out the Chinese influence, although they're still investors, but they still make concentrates that go to China, although allegedly uh, they intend to restart some of their other operations that would at least separate some of the rare earths. But we currently have zero rare earths production in this country outside of of that although energy fuels is just starting up a new what would you call it? production um they have a pilot scale to treat monazites uh and make some rare earth uh, precipitates so there we are yep. yeah i read about that i guess that's in georgia is that correct the the well, yeah, it is. Camores makes, because of treating mineral sands, they make a byproduct of monazite that contains rare earths. So they have a, an agreement with Energy Fuels in Utah to ship that concentrate to them and treat it for the rare earths and the uranium content and manifest some of the uh, radioactive components, the thorium and, and, and residual uranium in their uh, tailings pond there. So that might be an opportunity for the United States. They've just signed a deal with a group, I think they're in Estonia, uh, mm -hmm. Neo Materials, that can separate and make uh, individual rare earths. So there might be some, um, some renewed, um, what would you call it, extended production. But we still have no separation or reduction facilities in the United States at all. Alan, you, thank you, Corby. Alan, did you have a comment? Yeah, I don't know where the hand is. Hey, hey Corby, I, I, I work as an executive non-political running oil and gas at the Department of Energy over the oh, last yeah. few years. And, and uh, so that was FE32 and our sister office was FE22 Clean Coal. So uh, I guess you're aware of the National Energy Technology Laboratory yes. has been doing work. And I'm just sharing it with others, including a techno-economic analysis uh, because they were trying to extract um, Yes. I'll use bad, bad geology here, good stuff from coal. Yes. And, um, and because of the paucity of rare earth elements in the United States and the need for them for a whole bunch of sources, especially to produce uh, computer screens, um, I think they were successful at recovering, uh, would you tell me, a decent amount of rare earths well, from coal. Alan, uh, you, you bring up a very good point. Um, it's a yes and no answer. Okay. Uh, and I've, I've, I've been back to Pittsburgh and reviewed their programs twice. And because of COVID, I didn't go this year. So yes, there is an effort to recover rare earths from coal and coal waste. The problem is the United States has no downstream processing infrastructure. So okay. you recover some kind of mixed precipitate of rare earths. And then what do you do with it? You hope the Chinese will take it because they have invested heavily in the facilities to separate and reduce rare earths, and they have twice the capacity that they need so they can control the market. So we can do those things. Although um, the coal people have been talking with energy fuels recently that maybe they will take some of their materials. So it's, an, it's a mixed bag there. There's no, there's no end game in the United States right now for rare earths. We don't produce, well, I take that back. There is a group called Urban Mining that's recycling uh, magnetic materials, if you want to call it that. But there's no primary production of magnets or other rare earths in the United States. We gave that away. Oops. Anyway, 
Well, this is a, it's good that we're finally talking about these issues and we're thinking about solutions. So I um, appreciate that. So are, are there any, any thoughts from people that are in energy minerals or in um, the sustainability committee? So Julian, do you have any, or Denise, great. Denise. <laughs> waiting for my video to come up maybe oh here we go yeah i i'd actually i noticed that alex nakulin has joined if he's still online he's doing research in um for my alma mater binghamton university on orphaned oil and gas wells and maybe he could give a um, a quick statement or two about the work he's doing with unmanned aerial vehicles and locating orphaned oil and gas wells and his vision on how this would apply what it can do to integrate with the geothermal process and also, let's see, anybody else that's joined that wants to comment? But I'll, I'll do, give my time over to Alex Nikulin if he's still online. Thanks, Denise. Yes, Denise, uh, thank you so much okay. for, for giving us the opportunity. Um, I apologize, my quality, sound quality is probably gonna be terrible, so I was not expecting to speak in my, um, but yes, we are, we are using uh, some of the latest uh, near surface sure. geophysics, but actually using using drones to look, locate some of these old oil and gas wells that are you know they've, they've penetrated the older firm formation. And a lot of the stuff we're dealing with is basically um, some of the shale um, that's what we're talking about. Um, I don't want to take too much time. I'll just say that we are presenting this at the uh, AAPG um, in Denver. So hopefully we'll we'll see you guys there. And uh, there's, there's, there's a lot of interesting things going on. So I, I think it's, it's a great, it's great that we're having these, these conversations. And I was fascinated to hear about the rare earth uh, dilemmas and questions. So I, I thank you so much for, for including me on this. Thank you, Alex. That's great. I, I'd, I'd like to make a comment. Uh, Alex is a new father, so I, I may have disturbed him uh, with his very necessary sleep, but I appreciated him joining in at the, at the last minute. But I think this, what I'm seeing um, from a sustainability and sustainable energy development, these types of discussions are critical where you're bringing a nexus between, let's see, 77 participants now over hundred earlier, um, we're, a little, we're past the hour. But this is what we need to be doing is having these discussions. What do we know? What do we know in the past that we can share with those addressing problems now? Who's out there giving training? How do we make a better connection to look at energy through new eyes? with old data. So I, I think uh, I wanna encourage everybody to keep coming to these types of um, meetings to have these discussions. Take your information offline. If you haven't saved the chat, please do so. There's quite a bit of information there in the chat about um, what's going on, especially with rare earth elements and critical minerals. There's a, um, several companies that are in Denver, Colorado. If you can make it to ACE 2021 virtually or online, we're really going to be focusing on uh, this crossover, this pivot, if you will, uh, between uh, conventional oil and gas, the skill sets we have, the data sets we have, and how to turn that into uh, different types of energy, be it geothermal, critical minerals for uh, battery technology. I'm, I am fascinated by locating um, orphaned oil and gas wells, which go back to the 1900s before there were databases. I'm working in an area now that, uh, Alex, we need to talk about having you fly this area. We don't know where our wells are, um, but there's a lot that's going out there in terms of sustainable development and traditional geoscience. So thank you, Susan, for organizing this. Oh, no, thank you. And um, Lyle has been making some, um, I'm going to ask Julian to add chat in a second. Uh, Lyle's been putting some really good information in the chat. It's going quickly. So I was wondering if you would mind summarizing and talking about some of this. Sure. <clears throat> yeah, I come out of the mining industry as a background, although like Corby, I'm a chemical engineer by background as well. And I'm certainly familiar with Corby's work. Um, the whole critical minerals piece, you know, Canada is a, potentially a great ally for the US. We have lots of mineral potential up here. I live in Alberta, not in Calgary. Um, and there's lots of mineral potential in many of the provinces of of Canada, but there is there are ongoing projects in the U.S. as well. But getting anything permitted in the U.S. right now just seems to be almost impossible. Whether it's the three mines being proposed in Minnesota that are receiving an awful lot of pushback, the Pebble Mine in Alaska is an ongoing debacle. Uh, the, I saw the decision on the on the copper mine issue in Arizona uh, oh, this week. 
uh, there doesn't seem to be any way to to actually get things done. But you know, the Eagle Mine in Minnesota, uh, in Michigan, yeah. actually got permitted a decade ago. They they did it. I'm not sure how. You know, every state is different. Um, but we don't have the the manufacturing industry in Canada, although we do have a decent auto sector and auto pack with the U.S. But we've got the raw materials needed for for the EVs and, and all these other things. And, you know, Canada is not going to get taken over to be the 51st state, but uh, we can certainly be a strong partner. And I don't know in the oil industry, when you talk ESG programs and stuff, if you have standards that you work towards or not, but if you are interested in standards development for that, the Mining Association of Canada runs a really good program called Towards, Towards Sustainable Mining, has a number of protocols for, for high ESG credentials that was actually adopted today by the Australian minerals industry as well. So it's being used now in several countries around the world um, and certainly is being recognized as, as one of the leading programs out there for great ESG programs in the resources industry. So it might help you guys with some of what you're dealing with. Lyle, you denied being in Calgary. Where are you at in Alberta then? I'm, I'm an old Sherrick guy, Corby, so I live in Edmonton. Oh, okay. You're way up north. Okay. Yeah, yeah. 25 right. years at Sherrick, so. You know. Oh, yeah. And I, I started helped start up the refinery at Stillwater, so the, the uh -huh. BMR. Okay. So, yeah. I, I know you're neck of the woods, too. <laughs> While we're at the, on this topic, I highly recommend going to the Northern Miner. They have a lot of really yeah. good articles, and they have a podcast that's really great to listen to. If you got and they, they have some really good in-depth um, interviews with people who are currently grappling with some of the issues of, of um, well, basically economic minds. Yeah, and you know, it's, it's tough. They, especially in the, the nickel and cobalt industry, you know, th this is not meant to be at all racist. The, the Chinese are eating our lunch. They're state, oh God, they're, they're killing us dead. Absolutely, their, their approach of investing for strategic purposes rather than market purposes. Oh yeah. That they're developing nickel mines in Indonesia, cobalt operations in the Congo and stuff that will, that our market approach simply won't allow us to build. I'm, you know, you can see I'm with, I spend part of my time with Giga Metals. We have a project in BC. It's gonna cost a couple of billion dollars to, to execute. And coming up with that kind of money on patient capital that will wait, you know, 15 years for its return, that's, that's tough. Well, you know, right. Lyle, you, you bring up a very good point, and I always like to give my mantra because I'm a, I'm a professor. The other, the other problem we have, and uh, I've been to China and visited their educational and research facilities, while in, you know, we talked about rare earths and there's no downstream processing in Canada, the United States, which is the domain of mineral processing and extractive metallurgy. In China, they have twice the capacity and uh, schools that do research and education in mineral processing extractive metallurgy, not only in Canada, but the United States and Australia are diminishing. The Chinese have 38 schools of extractive metallurgy. They have 38 schools of mineral processing and they are well stocked with both money and pupils. Central South University has a thousand undergraduates in mineral processing, 500 graduate students. So, you know, I'm, I'm sitting here in Montana. I'm working virtually. I'm right south of here, Lion. And my analogy to that is, uh, do you feel like Custer? Because you should. We are, <laughs> surrounded, we are surrounded by very motivated, focused, talented people and a talented country that has a clear agenda to dominate the resource sector. And you're right, nickel and cobalt, they own it. Look at the nickel pig iron, look at what they did in the DRC. And then you look in copper, they own copper smelting right now, all of that. And we're slowly waking up saying, well, I mean, I, I know I'm, I know I'll get in trouble for this. We have to go find more of these things. Well, no, we don't. We have to do something a little bit more downstream because even if we find them, we're not allowed to develop them or do anything with them in North America. I'll, and I'll be quiet now, but that's a, that's the problem. 
Yeah, well, you can still permit mines in Canada. That's 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 well true. Established. Yeah, um, and, yeah, and you're right. A lot of potential. Yeah. You're right. Across most of the periodic table. Not in the United States. No, I. What was the last mine permitted in the U.S. that and and brought into production? I don't Nevada, know. Nevada, Nevada copper was brought into production, but I'm sitting here again working virtually in Montana, and we have the Black Butte Copper Project, which has permits. I was just talking to some of the people. They said now we're waiting to deal with the lawsuits, and that's mm -hmm. how it works. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Blackbird Cobalt. You know, it it may yeah. get reopened, but well, they're gonna. Not. Oh, yeah, oh, black. well, they get the formation people, but they have an Australian company that's going to make a concentrate and send it to Brazil. Yeah, I know those guys. You know, yeah, I know them for a year. I mean, here we are. So, I yeah. mean, don't get me wrong. My geological colleagues, I love you all. I don't know geology. It, it's, it's not really a problem of finding. It's, it's a problem once you find it, allowing us to do something. That's the problem. Yeah, permitting processes and, oh, and processing. Well, well this, this is, yeah, this is um, sobering. And, and I wonder how people who are getting started in their careers are reacting to these types of, of exchanges and information. Uh, uh, Julian, um, what are some of your thoughts? Just on the yeah, it's, it's, first of all, this is a fantastic discussion. I, I didn't really know much about the critical minerals space. Like I've always heard about it and some different things thrown around, but you know, Corby, Lyle, Alan and all have really sort of demystified that. And it's been great listening more about it. Uh, it was interesting because Denise gave a talk about the value of leadership. It was a few months ago. And she said a, a key quote by uh, someone called Helen Smith, which was, geos are the essential workers of the energy transition. And that's exactly what we're seeing now. Lots of students now that are pursuing masters or PhDs, they're trying to figure out ways to involve things uh, such as machine learning, data analytics, but then also CCUS. Uh, there are also a lot of inversion studies that are going on uh, from, I think in Denmark, I need to double check, but they're using inversion for characterizing CCUS in local places. Uh, so there's all of this research that's coming out and the young professionals are really trying to embrace it and run with it. But the only thing that they're stuck on is where do we run? Right, and that's where avenues like this, Susan, like what the Sustainable Development Podcast does, LinkedIn is is educate the young professionals on what are the opportunities out there, how are they growing, and how can they get a part of it. So, that's at least a lot of the things that we've been seeing. I appreciate that perspective, and I, I think that another um, breakthrough with technology. It has to come in terms of energy storage, et cetera. So we are not so reliant on scarce minerals. And I don't know what that would be. I've heard a lot about battery technology, big mass batteries. Um, I don't know if Corby, you or Lyle have, have worked much with big mass batteries or Rick, have you? Are you? I have not. The, the whole battery piece like it, it's coming at us hard and fast and it's going to be one of the significant storage mechanisms, but it's a really crappy storage mechanism to take you through winter. Um, <laughs> we, we need other means. And so, you know, geothermal is a fantastic energy production method for baseload energy that doesn't need storage, right. um, but it's not practical everywhere. Here in Alberta, we've got one well being drilled now, but we need like 12 inch wells to get enough water flow because uh, we don't have the, as high a temperature. Um, pumped hydro only works if you've got the right topography and are willing to flood it. Uh, I don't think we're going to flood the you know, Banff and Jasper National Parks in Canada, so Alberta's hooped. Uh, we won't have pumped hydro here at, at any extent, but they're doing it in California. Um, hydrogen is not a good solution for energy storage. Um, it's so wasteful that... Uh, it's a shame to take renewable energy and throw two thirds of it away to, to make hydrogen and bring it back when we need clean hydrogen for industrial purposes, right? And we need lots of it. All your fertilizers come from a nitrogen base, which comes from hydrogen. Um, compressed air storage and all these other things, the pump water storage, that's cool. Um, love to see any of those actually hit the big time. 
right? Because we will need it. There's no question. While in, in, in Montana, we have for energy storage, we have diesel generators in our garage. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, interesting point. And, and Ursula's making a good point about super sun size in the mining. And you know, the same issue was the same issue in, in Russia and then being in Azerbaijan and the Sungait. At any rate, that was more processing. Ursula, would you want to comment? Yeah, I mean, I went to school at uh, CU Boulder in Colorado and uh, took a class in aqueous geochemistry with uh, Don Ronald and um, studied a lot of the different uh, uh, scalings and um, water pollution from those mines. So that's why, that's why we don't have any mining going on anymore. So, yeah, so, you know, let go, so, right? I, I would say you can mine sustainably. The question is, are you willing to pay for it? And to date, the world has not been willing to pay for the externalities of the resource industries, be they CO2 or mine pollution or something else. Be, we've got a lot of bad things, the super, fun, the super pit in Butte and, and lots of others from our history that is going to tint people's view of things. There's a big coal mining debate in Canada going on right now. Um, but it can be done if we're willing to pay for it. The question remains, are we willing to pay for it? So China's building nickel mines in, in Indonesia that will make nickel for, uh, you know, a CO2 footprint of something like six to eight times what would be considered best in class, which would come out of the, Mon the Minnesota mines, um, all the way to, to, to nickel. And, you know, Elon wants clean nickel, but is anybody willing to pay more? And I think when you when you understand the fundamental realities, if you wanted to pay for, if you wanted an EV with clean nickel in it, it might cost you three bucks a pound of nickel more than you know so-called dirty nickel. That's three hundred dollars on the price of your car. It's peanuts. But the car company, the EV companies, don't want to admit that they're not willing to pay it yet. Yet, I think it'll get there. Well, right? it can you. be done. Yeah. I've yeah. seen good mining done. Well, that's good. Yeah. That's, that's, that's encouraging. Great. Yeah, thank you, Ursula, too. And, and so we're, we're, we're out of time, but I want to give Rick Fritz the last few words. No, I, I really, this is uh, exactly the type of thing we should be doing more of. And uh, I just do want to say that I, I noticed in the uh, uh, the uh, Wall Street Journal in late December that, you know, that uh, bastion of, uh, of high tech, they uh, said that uh, though that for alternate energy, if you don't have uh, energy storage, you're just uh, you're not you're not thinking right. So um, uh, I I talked to some uh, some friends about that. There's some government grants going out with with compressed air, uh, which could also be used for hydrothermal when it comes back, depending on the reservoir it's put in. So I like that because it's you know another geo job that you can uh, look at, but. Anyway, uh, there's a lot of different pathways here, so we're all trying to work it out. And uh, in the end, we want to make sure the young young people find jobs, and that's that's most important. So, thank thanks to all of you for uh, for this discussion. Absolutely, and I want to to again thank um, Energy Minerals Division, Ursula Thomas, and also um, the Sustainability Committee with Bill Maloney and Denise Cox and Julian Jenin, and um, if I'm missing anyone in the- And Sarah Barnes. Sarah Barnes, great, thank you, thanks. Yeah, so this is great, we'll do it again, and I will be sending an email with, with uh, links to the recording, and also I'm going to see if I can get copies of the PowerPoints to also share. So anyway, thank you, and want to um, wish you a good evening. Bye-bye, everyone. Thanks. Thank you again, Susan. Take care, everyone. Thank you for the great insights. Adios.